Hey, everyone. Welcome to our event, Pure Storage, the path to sustainable IT. I'm your host, Lisa Martin. Very pleased to welcome back one of our CUBE alumni, Ajay Singh, joins me, the Chief Product Officer at Pure Storage. Ajay, it's great to have you back on the program. Great to be back on, Lisa. Good morning. Good morning. And sustainability is such an important topic to talk about. So we're going to really unpack what Pure is doing. We're going to get your viewpoints on what you're seeing. And you're going to leave the audience with some recommendations on how they can get started on their ESG journey. First question, we've been hearing a lot from Pure, Ajay, about the role that technology plays in organizations achieving sustainability goals. What's been the biggest environmental impact associated with with customers achieving that given the massive volumes of data that keep being generated. Absolutely, Lisa, you can imagine that the data is only growing and exploding. Uh, and, 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 and there's a good reason for it. You know, data is the new currency. Some people call it the new oil uh, and the opportunity to go process this data, gain insights is really helping customers drive an edge in the digital transformation. It's going to make a difference between them being on the leaderboard a decade from now when the digital transformation kind of pans out versus, you know, being kind of somebody that, you know, quite missed the boat. So data is super critical. Uh, and, and obviously as part of that, we see all these big benefits, but it has to be stored. And 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 that means it's going to consume a lot of resources. Uh, and, and, the, and therefore data center usage has only accelerated, right? You can imagine the amount of data being generated, uh, you know, a recent study uh, pointed to roughly by 2025, 175 zettabytes, which e where each zettabyte is a billion terabytes. So just think of that size and scale of data. That's huge. Uh, and, and they also say that, uh, you know, pretty soon today, in fact, in the developed world, um, every person is having an interaction with the data center literally every 18 seconds. So whether it's on Facebook or Twitter or, you know, your email, people are constantly interacting with data. So you can imagine this data is only exploding. It has to be stored and it consumes a lot of energy. In fact, it oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was saying, in fact, uh, you know, there's uh, some studies have shown that data center usage literally consumes one to two percent of global energy consumption. So if there's one place we could really help climate change and, and all those aspects, if you can kind of really, you know, tamp down the data center energy consumption. Sorry, you were saying? I was just going to say, it's it's an incredibly important topic. And the the, the stats on data that you provided, and also I, I like how you talked about, you know, every 18 seconds we're interacting with a data center, whether we know it or not. We think about the long-term implications, the fact that data is growing massively as you shared with the stats that you mentioned. If we think about though, the responsibility that companies have. Every company in today's world needs to be a data company, right? And yes. we, consumers expect it. We expect that you are going to deliver these relevant uh, personalized experiences, whether we're doing a transaction in our personal lives or in business. But what is the, what uh, requirements do technology companies have to really start building down their carbon footprints? No, absolutely. If you kind of think about it, uh, just to kind of finish up the data story a little bit, the explosion is to the point where, in fact, if you just recently was in the news that Ireland went up and said, oh, sorry, uh, we can't have any more data centers here. We just don't have the power to supply them. And that was big in the news and you know all the hyperscalers are scratching their head. I know they've come around that and figure out a way around it, but it's getting there. Some some organizations and, and areas, jurisdictions are saying pretty much no data centers at all. You know, we're, we just can't do it. Uh, and so, as you said, so companies like Pure, I mean, our view is that IT has an opportunity here to really do our bit for climate change and be able to you know, drive a sustainable environment. Uh, and, and at Pure, we believe that uh, you know, today's data success really ultimately hinges on energy efficiency. You know, so to, to really be energy efficient means you are going to be successful long term with data. Because if you think of classic data infrastructures, the legacy infrastructures, you know, we've got disk infrastructures, hybrid infrastructures, flash infrastructures, low-end systems, medium-end systems, high-end systems. So a lot of silos, you know, a lot of inefficiency across the silos because the data doesn't get used across that. In fact, you know, today, a lot of data centers are not really built with kind of the efficiency and environmental mindset. So there's a big opportunity there. So Ajay, talk to me about some of the steps that Pure is implementing as its chief product officer. We'd love to get your 
your thoughts. What steps is it implementing to help Pure's customers become more sustainable? No, absolutely. So essentially, we're all inherently motivated, like Pure and, 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 and everybody else, to solve problems for customers and really forward the status quo, right? You know, innovation. You know, that's what we're all about. And while we're doing that, <clears throat> the challenge is to how do you make technology and the data we feed into it faster, smarter, scalable, obviously, but more importantly, sustainable. And you can do all of that, but if you miss the sustainability bit, you're kind of missing the boat. And I also feel from an ethical perspective, that's really important for us, not only to do all the other things, but also kind of make it sustainable. In fact, today, 80% of the companies, the companies are realizing this, 80% today are in fact report out on sustainability, which is great. Uh, in fact, 80% of leadership at companies, you know, CEOs and senior executives say they've been impacted by some climate change event. You know, but it's a fire in the place they had to evacuate or floods or storms or uh, hurricanes, you, you name it, right? Uh, so mitigating the carbon impact can, in fact, today be a competitive advantage for companies because that's where the puck is going and everybody's, uh, you know, uh, is skating, wanting to skate towards the puck. And it's good. It's good business, too to be sustainable and, and, and meet these you know, customer requirements. In fact, the, the recent uh, survey that we released today uh, is saying that more and more organizations are kickstarting their sustainability initiatives, and many take you know, are, are aiming to make a significant progress against that over the next decade. So that's that's really you know, part of the big uh, uh, the release. So our view is that that IT infrastructure you know, can really make a big push towards greener IT, and not just kind of greenwash it, but actually, you know, you know, make things more uh, greener and 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 really take the the lead in uh, in uh, uh, ESG. And so it's important that organizations can reach alignment with their IT teams and challenge their IT teams to continue to lead, uh, you know, for the organization the sustainability aspects. I'm curious, Ajay, when you're in customer conversations, are you seeing that it's really the C-suite plus IT coming together? And, and how does Peer help facilitate that? Because to your point, IT needs to be able to deliver this, but it's it's a board level objective these days. Absolutely. We're seeing increasingly, especially in Europe with the, you know, the war in Ukraine and the energy crisis that, you know, that's, that's you know, unleashed. Uh, we definitely see it's becoming a bigger and bigger board level objective uh, for, for a lot of companies. And we definitely see customers in starting to do that. Uh, so, so in particular, uh, I do want to touch briefly on what steps we are taking as a company, uh, you know, to, to, to make uh, 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 IT sustainable. Uh, and obviously customers are doing all the things we talked about and, and, and we're also helping them become smarter with data. Uh, but the key difference is, you know, we have a big focus on efficiency, which is really optimizing performance per watt with unmatched storage densities. So you can reduce the footprint and dramatically lower the power required. Uh, and and how efficient is that? You know, compared to other all flash systems, we tend to be one fifth. We tend to take one fifth the power compared to other flash systems, and substantially lower compared to spinning disk. Uh, so you can imagine, you know, cutting your if data center consumption is say two percent of global consumption, roughly forty percent of that tends to be storage because of all the spinning disk. So you're at about you know 0.8 percent of global uh, consumption, and if you can cut that by Four fifths, you know, you can already start to make an impact. Uh, so, so we feel we can do that, and also we're quite a bit more denser, ten times more denser. Uh, so, imagine one fifth the power, one tenth the density, but then we take it a step further because, okay, you've got the storage system in the data center, but what about the end of life aspect? What about the waste and reclamation? So, we also have something called non-disruptive upgrades. We're using our AI technology in Pure One. We can start to sense when a particular part is going to fail. And just before it goes to failure, we actually replace it in a non-disruptive fashion. So customers' data is not impacted. And then we recycle that. So you get a full end-to-end -end life cycle uh, you know, from all the way from the time you deploy, much lower power, much lower density, but then also at the back end, uh, you know, reduction in e-waste and those kind of things. That's a great point you, that you bring up in terms of the reclamation process. It sounds like Pure does that on its own. The customer doesn't have to be involved in that. That's right. 
Uh, and uh, we do that. It, it's a part of our uh, uh, evergreen uh, uh, you know, service uh, that we offer. Uh, a lot of customers sign up for the service. And we, in fact, they don't even, we tell them, hey, you know, that part's about to go. We're going to come in. We're going to swap it out. And, and then we actually recycle that part. The power of AI, I love that. What are some of the the things that companies can do if they're if they're early in this journey on sustainability? What are some of the specific steps companies can take to get started and maybe accelerate that journey as it's becoming climate change and things are becoming just more and more of a of a daily topic on the news? No, absolutely. There's a lot of things companies can do. In fact, there are four four items that we're going to highlight. Uh, the first one is, you know, they can just start by doing a materiality assessment. And a materiality assessment essentially engages all the stakeholders to find out which specific issues are important for the business, right? So you identify your key priorities that intersect with what the stakeholders want, you know, your different groups from sales, customers, partners, you know, different departments in the organization. And for example, for us, when we conducted our materiality assessment, for us, a product we felt was the biggest area of focus that could contribute a lot towards, you know, making an impact uh, in, in, in from a sustainability standpoint. So that's number one. I think number two, companies can also think about taking an as-a-service approach. Uh, the beauty of the as-a-service approach is that you are buying, a, your customers are buying outcomes with SLAs. Uh, and, and when you're starting to buy outcomes with SLAs, you can start small and then grow as you consume more. So that way you don't have system sitting idle, waiting for you to consume more, right? And that's the beauty of the as a service approach. Um, and so, for example, for us, you know, we have something called Evergreen One, you know, which is our as a service offer where uh, essentially customers are able to only use and have you know, systems turned on to as much as they're consuming. So, so that reduces the waste associated with underutilized systems, right? That's number two. Number three is also you can optimize your supply chains end to end, right? But basically by making sure you're moving, recycling, packaging, and eliminating waste in that thing so you can recycle it back to your suppliers. Uh, and you can also choose a sustainable supplier network that's following sort of good practices, you know, you know across the globe. Um, and such supply chains that are responsive and diverse can really help you also, the business benefit is you can also handle surges in demand. Uh, for example, for us during the uh, pandemic with this global supply chain shortages, you know, whereas most of our competitors, you know, lead times went to 40, 50 weeks, our lead times were, went from three to six weeks because, you know, we had this sustainable, uh, you know, supply chain. Um, and so all of these things, uh, you know, the three things are important, but the fourth thing I say is more cultural. And, and the cultural thing is how do you actually begin to have sustainability become a core part of your ethos as a company, you know, across all the departments, you know, and we're at Pure, definitely it's big for us, uh, you know, you know, uh, around sustainability, starting with the product design, but all other areas as well. So if you follow those four items, those are a great place to start. That's great advice, great recommendations. You talk about the the, the supply chain sustainable supply chain optimization. We've been having a lot of conversations with businesses and vendors alike about that and how important it is. You bring up a great point too on supplier diversity. We could have a whole conversation on that. Yes. But I'm also glad, Ajay, that you brought up culture. That's huge to for organizations to adopt an ESG strategy and really drive sustainability in their business. It has to become, to your point, part of their ethos. That's yes. challenging. Cultural change management is challenging, although I think with climate change and the things that are so public, it's it's more on, on the top minds of folks. But it's a great point that the organization really as a whole needs to embrace the sustainability mindset so that it as a as an organization lives and breathes that. Yes. My last question for you is advice. So you you outlined the four steps organizations can take. I look how you made that quite simple. Um, what advice? would you give organizations who are on that journey to adopting those, those um, actions, as you said, as they look to really build and deploy and execute an ESG strategy? No, absolutely. And so obviously, uh, you know, the advice is going to come from, you know, a company like Pure, you know, our background kind of being a supplier of products. Uh, and so, you know, our advice is for companies that have products, usually they tend to be the biggest generator 
the products that you sell to your customers, especially if they've got hardware components in it. But, you know, the biggest generator of e-waste and 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 kind of from a sustainability standpoint. So it's really important to have an intentional design approach towards your products with sustainability in mind. So it's not something that's that you kind of handle at the very back end. You design it up front in the product. And so that sustainable design becomes very intentional. So for us, for example, doing these non-disruptive upgrades had to be designed up front so that you know, a or you know, one of our repair pers- person could go into a customer shop and be able to pull out a card and put in a new card without any change in the customer system. That non-disruptive approach it has to be designed into the hardware software systems to be able to pull that on. And that intentional design enables you to recover pieces just when they are about to fail, and then putting them through a recovery, you know, waste recovery process. So that that's kind of the one thing I would say. That philosophy, uh, again, it comes down to if that is, you know, seeping into the culture, into your core ethos, you will start to do, you know, you know that type of work. Uh, so, so I mean, it's an important thing, you know, look, this year, you know, with the spike in energy prices, you know, you know gas prices going up, it's super important that all of us, uh, you know, do our bit in there and start to drive products that are fundamentally sustainable, not just at the initial, you know, install point, but from an end-to-end full life cycle standpoint. Absolutely. And I love that you brought up intention. That is everything that Pure's doing is with, with such thought and intention and really for organizations in any industry to become more sustainable, to develop an ESG strategy, to your point, it all needs to start with intention and, of course, that that cultural adoption. Ajay, it's been so great to have you on the program talking about what Peer is doing to help organizations really navigate that path to sustainable IT. We appreciate your insights and your time. Thank you, Lisa. Pleasure being on board. Great to have you. For Ajay Singh, I'm Lisa Martin. You're watching the special event, Peer Storage, The Path to Sustainable IT.